Kings, queens, and everyone. Nope, there's a car coming. <laughs> Kings, queens, and everyone in between, welcome back to Gears and Queers. I'm Jake. And I'm Chris. And today we're taking you back to the 90s with this 1990 Buick Riata. Today we're going to take you on the tour of this halo car that lost its wings and, hey, we might even go to Sears. Maybe not. Wow, Christopher, today, a blast from the past. We're taking it back to the 90s. We're in a 1990 Buick Riata. And how did we get here? Uh, I'm, uh, that's just like American capitalism, frankly. I... In the car. Oh, in the car. Oh, this actually belongs to our good friend, uh, Casey Wright, AKA Queer Mechanic on Instagram. So go over and check out his page. We'll link it below. But he has so graciously loaned us this wonderful little Lux Coupe from Buick. I mean, this is, this is a strange one, to be frank. It's not a performance car. No. And it's not a luxury car. No. It's not an outright one. So um, it's kind of some, some weird in between. Well, I mean, let's discuss like what this is. So this was Buick's attempt at a halo car. This launched for the 88 model year on the E platform, basically. Yeah, it's a shortened E body. It's also, you know, one of the infamous much maligned, um, but famous still, 3,800 engines. So this is, I think, this is a car of, of high highs and low lows. It's certainly interesting. And yeah. I think possibly more interesting than it is good. Where did this start? Like this is, I mean, we're still working with GM of like Pontiac, Buick, GMC, Chevy, the heyday of the brands for GM. Like, what was the main competitor for this car? Well, they targeted the Mercedes-Benz SL, the R107 generation. That is crazy to me. Also, this car is front-wheel drive, and it was less than half the price of the SL. A bit of a reach there, if, if I'm being honest. A front-wheel drive V6 in a time when American luxury really meant, like, you needed a V8. And rear-wheel drive. So let's talk about some highs, especially from where you're sitting in the driver's seat now. Well, I gotta say, this thing has a really interesting digital dash. Oh, that's the best part. That is absolutely the best part. That, that green glow of GM electronics in the 90s. Yeah, and it still works. This is a 30-year-old car. Granted, it only has about 87,000 miles, a little bit less than. But you know what the Riata is known for that we are notably lacking in this vehicle? Is the touchscreen CRT. So if you go peep Doug DeMuro's video, which I'm sure is like the highest ranking video on the subject of Buick Riatas. He lucked out, so he found a pretty mint, I think 88 or 89, because it only lasted for like one or two model years. CRT touchscreen, which we do not have, sorry. We do have the optional CD player. Which was two grand in 1990. Which, yes. Yeah, my God. It's so strange, so we've got that. We're riding on the E-body, but we actually have four wheel independent suspension, which I think it handles pretty good. What do you think? Yeah, it's a pretty like competent handler. I wouldn't say anything crazy. Again, but Buick didn't need a sports car. They didn't. That was Pontiac's job and <laughs> Cadillac was for luxury cars. So Buick was kind of like, all right, um, you're somebody's uncle. Your name is Keith. How do you, how do you, <laughs> what? They didn't know what this car could be. And for the most part, it's, it's interesting and it's not bad. It's, it's competent handling. The suspension is nice. The brakes aren't too bad. They're fine. They're a lot better than most. at the top. Yeah. They do get, get you stopping pretty Per quickly. usual GM. And then and then you're saddled with this freaking boat anchor of an engine and like rubber band box of a transmission. This transmission is garbage. This being a 1990, that four speed auto is not even electronically controlled. <sighs> so yeah. it's kind of like, what's going on in there? Maybe there's a small hamster that's doing its best, trying to select the right ratio that you want, and it chooses the wrong one every time. Exactly. It looks good though, I think. It is so cool, honey flip up headlights, hello. Yeah, like the whole assembly comes up. This really short rear deck, this little squat, like the, the rear overhang so is chunky. nothing. And then you've got what's clearly front wheel drive architecture in this long hood and stretched out front axle. It's strange, but I really like it. It's like the most weird proportions. Like, I don't even know if you could call it beautiful, but it's definitely like... Distinctive. Yes, yeah, great word. Wonderful. Excellent. This excites people online. It's, it's a, it's, I think it's a definite watermark for uh, whatever the hell was going on over there in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, also, when was the last time you saw one of these? 
Never. I have seen never one, seen one specifically one that I can recall, and it was at the like Advance Auto Parts in my high school town, mm. and I cannot recall ever seeing one ever since then. Probably getting transmission fluid. The interior is also where we're really going to talk about GM low points, As, like dash and CRT, if optioned, aside. I mean, it's it's exactly what you expect. It is like Fisher Price levels of plastic. It's hysterical. Also. My passenger compartment side, like with the glove box and my dash, is a solid six inches past your driver pod, and it feels like I'm in a completely separate car over here. It's really strange. It's like I'm driving the car, the motorcycle, you're in the sidecar. <laughs> yes, I do feel like I'm in a sidecar. It's so strange. The thing that I find so weird about this car is that it was hand built at the Lansing Craft Center. Yeah. And of notable fame, which is where they built the EV1 that followed. And you said the convertible was built by ASC, similar to the uh, like that Grand Prix that ASC Grand Prix with McLaren. Yeah. To its detriment, so many brands at GM and this like to just be dropped at the last second straight on their face, Absolutely. like dead on arrival. Yeah, I think GM pigeonholed Buick in particular mm -hmm. into a corner that they are still clamoring to get out of today. You've seen those like that's a Buick that's commercial. That's a Buick. Yeah, that's the beginning of all of that. It's so strange. And they built 20,000 of these. These are like relatively rare. I also do want to talk about these seats because my god, there is no such thing as a proper driving position unless you're maybe 5'2 and neither of us are. <laughs> and they don't go any further back than this. Yet we've got the Grand Canyon for a parcel shelf behind us. I don't understand. It's, there's nowhere near enough room for that to be a back seat, and especially not with the way that the rear greenhouse area is shaped, but it's more than adequate for a parcel shelf. Yeah. Like it's too big for that. The trunk is also a fairly decent size already. Some would say, why didn't they just bring that forward? Yeah. Um, it makes knows. no sense. And there's, there's not even like any cargo hooks back there. Really, there's one, but it's a loop. It's not even a hook. So you can't really put bags back there. Or and fried the, rice. Or fried rice. Actually, I need to lock that down. My fried rice. Oh God. Anyway, however, it does make for a lovely sort of Concave. Le Corbusier lounge. Exactly. The greenhouse effect on this car, the way it's done, the pillarless windows, lovely. Yeah. You can see many things. You can turn over your head, you can see blind spots, who are they? And did she start the trend of blacked out A-pillars? She might have. A cantilevered roof? Who's to say? Looking at you, Nissan. That rear taillight. That full width taillight as well. Yeah, this was, this was sort of in that trend. Um, it's 14 light bulbs to light that entire thing up and it was almost cut because of uh, sheer cost, but it looks pretty damn good. Glad they kept it, glad it made it through. There was almost like a wraparound effect at the front as well with the headlights. There's a very sort of just like, the singularity to this car is like outward appearance that I really enjoy. She's so squat. This car was kind of having an identity crisis when it came out. Relatable. But what about its place in like today? That's a good question. There used to be coupes everywhere. You had Camry coupes, Accord coupes. Yeah, you didn't need four doors, you had a coupe. Yeah. And now everybody drives car-based crossovers. And then the only true coupes are like, you know, nearly $100,000 performance cars. Yeah, like ultra luxury or like ultra performance. Like right. very few middle of the road coupes exist anymore. I mean, I don't even know if I know the answer to that. I mean, is this a future classic? I don't know if there's enough redeeming qualities to make it so. Maybe the early CRT touchscreen ones, maybe, but those break so often. Who knows? It, honestly, it could be two weeks until we see one of these sell on Bring a Trailer for like 55 grand. Who fucking knows? I think the most we can do is appreciate that something even nearly this odd made it through what GM was going through in the 80s and 90s. Absolutely. Chasing the Germans and they still are today. And still losing, but you know, that's fine. We've gotten some really interesting yeah. vehicles that made it to production chasing that. Yeah. So I welcome it, I applaud it. Absolutely. Shout out to Casey again for letting us drive this. In the meantime, we will catch you guys in the next one. Um, and yeah, go follow Casey and go follow us on Instagram and hit that little notification bell, all the usual crap. But um, good to be back to uh, the normal reviews, but we will see you in a bit. Bye. Bye.